service of Holy Communion for the 18th Sunday after Trinity and St. Luke. And appropriately on St. Luke's Day, I look like I'm looking at the general resurrection here. Welcome back everybody and I'm so happy that you're feeling better after the mass outbreak of Covid which has held so many of you away from church these past few weeks. Clearly the prayers of St. Luke still work well. And welcome, of course, to those who are joining us online. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. How beautiful upon the mountains at the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, and announces salvation. Let us pray. So we pray together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom all secrets are hid, bend the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with all. And so we pray, most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved thee with our own heart. We have not loved the believers as ourselves. In thy mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are. And I repent what we shall. That we may do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And through the wholeness, wholesome medicine of the gospel, give your church the same love and power to heal through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
forever. Amen. Would you please sit for the lessons? <coughs> A reading from Isaiah 35, 3 to 6. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute sun shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The reading from 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 5, 17. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come and bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the passports. Alexander the metal work did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him, because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Our graduate hymn is morning number 98. <laughs>
written in that according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter, beginning to read at the first verse. Glory to you. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest upon them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise of the Apostles, which, if that's correct, means that by word count, St. Luke contributed over a quarter of the text of the New Testament, more than any other author, which is surprising given how hard St. Paul tried for that prayer. Luke is mentioned briefly a few times in the New Testament. In Colossians, he's referred to as a physician from the Greek word meaning someone who brings healing. So he's remembered both as a physician and as a disciple of St. Paul. It is believed he was a Greek physician from Antioch in ancient Syria. He was an educated man. You can tell that because there aren't many in the New Testament, but Luke writes very good Greek, uh, probably better than Paul and the two of them leave the rest a long way behind. The content of his writing makes scholars believe he was writing as a Gentile, convert to Gentiles. But as he stresses the scriptural Old Testament roots of the mission of St. Paul, he no doubt was also writing for the Jews who lived in these communities. If it's indeed true that Luke was a Gentile, it makes him the only non-Jew who writes in the New Testament. The second letter to Timothy attests that Luke was with Paul in his final time in Rome. He's believed to have been, uh, St. Luke is believed to have been martyred by being hung from an olive tree when he was 84 in Boeotia, and that his tomb was initially in Thebes before his relics were transferred in 357 to the great Hagia Sophia Cathedral in Constantinople. As is often the case when saints become venerated and popular, many claims are made. Presently, such claims amount to St. Luke having eight bodies and nine heads, in various places, all claiming authenticity. Although I think all this really means 
is his legacy was widespread and lasting. Luke is the patron saint, understandably, of physicians, of surgeons, of the related trade of butchers, because of course for many years butchers were the nearest you had in the local community to someone that knew how, knew had the knives and knew how to use them. And surprisingly, and I didn't know this, uh, St. Luke was, is the patron saint of bachelors. <laughs> and I never come here without looking at this plaque. That poor man who lived 90 years and was vicar here for over 60 of them. The one thing that they say first off is he died unmarried on the 30th of May, 1864. They clearly never forgave him for that. His symbol, St. Luke, is a winged bull or ox, and the earliest church believed widely that St. Luke was an icon painter, one of the very first icon painters. And there are several portraits of Our Lady attributed to the hand of St. Luke. St. Luke is among those who give us a wonderful and personal insight into the missionary work of the apostles and of the earliest church widening our understanding of what the very earliest Christians felt themselves called to in answer to their baptism and calling by God in Jesus Christ. What interests me about him and his calling is how central to the work of Jesus and the early church the language and practice of healing and making well was. Jesus in many ways reveals who he is through the acts of healing and repair of the broken and wounded. And it seems from the accounts that we have been given, the earliest church continued that work. And there is a conundrum there because in all honesty, despite many claims by contemporary Christians for physical healing, there's not a lot of evidence of this being provable. And if it does, it sure isn't that widespread. I've puzzled over this for years, and if you'll bear with me, and I'm not asking for agreement, just a hearing, I want to explain how I believe the Ministry of Healing is still central and vital to the work of the Church, but how I don't go along with an overemphasis of claims for uh, physical healing. Many things that were done in Jesus' earthly ministry had the primary purpose of revealing his divinity, his miracles, his healings, his acts of repairing the broken, are not claimed to be anything other than exceptional in the scriptures, as indeed so much of what he did was. There is little or no claim that these kind of things ever happened before Jesus, and it's almost as if the earliest church slowly moved away from such claims, after the era of the apostles themselves, those who had known and worked directly with Jesus. Jesus understood full well that illness is more than physical illness. Lack of health and well-being is a complex and a widespread reality of human life, covering not just the physical, but the emotional, the mental, and importantly, the spiritual, the health of the soul, is linked very much with the health of the mind and the health of the body. In Jesus' time, there was very little of what we would now call medicine, and people understood little of the causes of illnesses, often ascribing them in the scriptures to the sufferer's life or to their forebears, that illness, especially mental illness, what's called in, in scripture often being possessed by demons, were a playing out of the fight between good and evil in a person's life. What we do see in the New Testament is the importance of the urging Christians both to acknowledge and to try to assist in the sufferings of others, not judging them, but seeing illness in all its forms as something which can be addressed through love and fellowship even if this brings relief and comfort, not in reality physical healing. It is, of course, the irony that this life is a rich gift and blessing to each of us, 
but we are on a journey from God back to God. Our journeys will end in one way in this life. So even if physical healing were a reality, it would only be temporary. No one in scripture was ever claiming that the people that Jesus healed, or even Lazarus that he called back from the tomb, didn't eventually die. It is the human condition. It is one staging post in our life. And the scriptures tell us that in fact, of course, the only way past that is through faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ultimate defier and defeater of death, death itself. But I do believe very wholeheartedly that there are many people gifted with a variety of skills of healing and repair. Of course, mercifully for most of us, they are experts, scientists, doctors, surgeons, nurses, carers, the medical profession, which in human history has never been as advanced as it is now. It does so much to make life more of a gift, to reduce people's suffering, to make life more bearable for countless people, and should be celebrated by us all, because I believe it is a great gift from God. But we are all called upon to take part in the general work of healing. People need to be valued, listened to, included, enabled. This is all of our work. It brings about healing. Through We can take Jesus' Jesus's central idea of loving the neighbour as ourselves, to live out a life which has at its heart the well-being of other people, dying, as the New Testament says, to ourselves so we can live more fully for others, and that if we can find healing for them, they can live more the abundant life that God has called us to lead. I think equally needed today are the skills of diagnosing what in fact ails us and ails the present moment. And what ails other people that we come into contact with? Physical ails are still hard to bear, and they always have been. But so much eats away as well at our well-being. Greed and isolation, addiction, poverty, unemployment, stress, and so much more undermines our well-being. And our spiritual health, which even non-believers are happy to admit is key to overall well-being, is essential. We spend, many of us, lots of time on our physical health. Perhaps sometimes, and if you looked at my bathroom cabinet, you might think I'm one of them, we obsess a bit too much about the small things of health. But how much time do we spend on our essential spiritual well-being, our mental well-being, our emotional well-being. And I think this is key work for us and for others, for if we are trying to understand everything that ails us, then for sure we'll need to know how to treat the emptiness and the hopelessness that linger in the souls of so many people in today's modern world. St. Luke, I think, helps to keep these issues of health and of well-being and of healing central to the life of the church, and so it should be, seeking the health and happiness of others and of ourselves, freeing up everyone to lead the abundant life that God has blessed us with and intends for those he loves, is still a remarkable calling. So for that and for St. Luke, May God's holy name be praised. Amen. Amen. We stand now to affirm our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from God, through God, 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Refriending Lord, we celebrate with gratitude those friendships which bridge cultural and religious divides for the ways they enrich and enhance our lives. We give you thanks for all the blessings you give us in our lives. Help us to use them carefully and spread your love in the world around us. We ask you to bring peace where there is war and love where there is hatred. We remember the people of Ukraine and Russia and Pakistan, where lives have been lost and disrupted by natural disasters. Save your people from the sins of greed and selfishness. Let us be generous to those less fortunate than ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give guidance to your church, Lord. Bless her leaders, Archbishop Justin, Bishop Graham of Norwich, and Alan and Jane, bishops in the diocese. Bless King Charles, his government and opposition. Let them lead the country with wisdom and without pride. Locally, we are asked to pray for the businesses in our area, for all who work here and for their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we remember the life and work of St. Luke, the physician, we pray for all who work in our hospitals doctors, nurses, and support staff, our local GP practices and care homes. Bless them with health and strength to cope with today's epidemics. For all who suffer, Lord, in body, mind, or spirit, we ask your healing love. We continue our ministry of prayer for David Kirkland, Gwen Wallace, Sarah, Amelia, Kelly Sanderson, Christine Rayner, Brian Rayner, Anna Lottie Smith, Matthew Wise, Isla West, Stephen Milner, Julia, Glynis Fennick, Richard Rappel, Megan Mills, Linda Dunstan, Susan Townsend, Roy Wallace, and Peter Ashton. We give thanks for all that has been done to support them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all who have been faithful disciples, who have heeded your call and obeyed your commands. We pray for those who now serve you with your saints in glory, especially those recently departed, Violet Baker. 
and those whose anniversary occurs at this time. Olive Hardy, Kathleen Kirkland, Kathleen Ringwood, Leslie Gesborough, Evelyn Clark, Margaret Smith, Georgina Bannister, William Pegg, and Pam Roberts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Mary Magdalene, St. George, St. James the Great, and all your saints, we commend ourselves and one another to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand for the peace? We are the body of Christ, the one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also. Peace be with you. Um, if you'd like to be seated a moment. So the, the important notice first. Ruby's party. <laughs> As you know, due to uh, um, COVID, uh, the widespread outbreak, that had to be um, delayed. But it's going to be, um, I'm going to get this wrong, but I'm reading what's in front of me. On Tuesday, uh, from 4 to 6, at the community centre. So there you are. Got there at the end. That's great. So congratulations. I'm sorry I'm going to be missing it. I'll be at the Frankfurt Book Fair, but uh, I'll be thinking of you. Um, then you'll see that we have a communion here on Wednesday as usual, and then next Sunday our main Eucharist is at Castle Acre at 10.30, and there's morning praise at Pentney. Um, just a note to say thank you to everyone who took part in and generously contributed to our gift day uh, on the 8th. Uh, but just, as they say, to, to, to reassure you that um, our letterbox is still open and um, we are still receiving gifts from, uh, of any kind from anyone. So we've fallen a little short this year, which is hardly surprising given how people have been ill and away and things have not been, the timing of our gift day didn't turn out to be the best timing, but we didn't know that. So please uh, do encourage anyone who meant to contribute, who hasn't been able to yet, or hasn't found the time to do so. Uh, and that will be very graciously received. And I think that's all the notices I have, unless there are any others. No, good. Then uh, our offertory hymn this morning, number 600, no, number 767. <laughs>
So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is alive. Christ is Christ, 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 Christ. will come Lord of all life, for us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favor on your people, gather us in your loving arms, and bring us with the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Mary Magdalene, St. George, St. James the Great, St. Luke, and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the gift of God forever and ever.
eat and drink in the remembrance that Christ died, yet lives for you, and feed on him in your heart, by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Just to remind those who may not have seen this before, <coughs> presently we offer communion uh, with the host alone. If you wish to intinct, then I must do it for you, so I have a little cup on the, the pattern, and then we'll cut the chalice off it separately. It makes more sense when you see it. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Body of Christ, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Body and blood of our, the body of Christ, keep you in eternal life.
Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. So we pray together, Almighty God, we thank you for leading us with the body and blood of the Son of Jesus Christ, to live in our souls and bodies, to be a living sacrifice. Send us out to live and work to your prayer. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Our final hymn, 454.
Hello, David. Two envelopes for you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 